According to the most recent Pew data that I could find, 78% of American men are at least fairly certain that there's a God. But for American women, that number is closer to 90%. Weekly church attendance is more than 30% higher among women, and daily prayer is almost 50% higher. In addition, women are 30% more likely to cite their Christian faith as their primary source of moral guidance. All this despite the fact that the Christian religion venerates a book that treats women as property, admonishes them for thinking and speaking, blames them for all the ills of society, casts them in all the most villainous roles, and repeatedly appraises their value at about 50% of their penis counterparts at best. Now, that leads to an obvious question that's been bedeviling us since the show began. Why is religiosity so much higher among women? And while we still don't have an answer, in October we'll gain a valuable new tool in our investigation. The upcoming book, Women Beyond Belief, Discovering Life Without Religion, collects the deconversion stories of 22 atheist and agnostic women and offers us a bounty of insights from the feminine perspective. To talk more about it, I'm joined by the book's editor, Karen Garst. Karen, welcome to The Scathing Atheist. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Oh, you bet. And I have to say, when I first learned about this book, I was really excited. I've kind of been waiting for somebody to put together a collection like this for quite some time. So before we get to all the questions and whatnot, I just want to thank you for the effort. You're welcome. Now, uh, since this book is largely a book about women shedding religion, I want to start with you. What what brings you to atheism? Were you uh, religious growing up? Well, um, I was born in Bismarck, North Dakota. And uh, so that answers most of that yeah, question. Right. <laughs> um, I think that everybody I knew going to school, I knew every church they went to. I knew who was Catholic. I knew the five uh, Jewish families in town and which uh, Lutheran church they went to if they were Lutheran. Uh, I was raised as a Lutheran, and I often say that I would have had no social life in high school without Luther League. <laughs> we got together every Sunday, we went bowling, we uh, went roller skating, and uh, a lot of my really good friends were, uh, were in church. However, um, I, I went to a Lutheran college, Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, for my undergraduate degree. But I would say when I got to graduate school in Madison, Wisconsin, now this was in the 70s, I didn't really join a religious community. I, for me, religion was family. And it felt really odd to go to a church and not know anybody. So I kind of drifted away. And then in the 90s, there were uh, a number of books written by uh, the authors of the Jesus Seminar. And I was very interested. I read a lot of those. And I can credit uh, John Bishop uh, Shelby Spong, Bishop John Shelby Spong, <laughs> in his book, Resurrection, Myth or Reality, as the reason I finally let go of the last vestige of religion. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, included in the deconversion stories is your own story here. And you seem to have had a, a much easier time with religion than a lot of the authors. Uh, would you say that's fair? I think that's true. When I reread some of these essays, I, I, I come to tears. Uh, I'd like to tell you about one of them, one of the authors who was raised in a fundamental church. Uh, she says in her essay that she was taught that she was sin. Mm -hmm. And she has grappled with that her whole adult life. And she's probably in her late 40s. She sent me an email the other day. She was at the beautiful Oregon coast and said, I went outside. I paused, I relaxed, and I felt good about myself. And she said, I think writing the essay had a lot to do with it. Awesome. Well, that's really good to know because there were times when I was reading it when I thought, you know, there were a lot of very, like, unflinching and self-deprecating admissions within this book. And there were times when I thought, like, if I was in your shoes, I'd feel a little guilty for asking someone to relive that. Uh, but I can imagine it's, it's going to be cathartic, not just for them, but also for the readers. Exactly. And the whole purpose of the book uh, and why I concentrated on women, and I appreciate the statistics uh, that you stated earlier, is to give people an example of somebody else who's gone through it. I think we all look toward models. Oh, can I do that? Well, somebody else did it. I think I can do it too. And as they read these stories, and they may skip over some of them. They may not relate to them. But if they see other women who have let go of religion and they're thinking about that, I think this will help them take that final step. So is that your primary audience then, is, is women who are maybe questioning their faith or just coming out of their faith? I think so. And 
I um, hope to sell the book to uh, both men and women who know somebody that maybe is on the fence or wants some additional information that this will be helpful to them. As you said in your introduction, there aren't a lot of books written about stories about women atheists uh, who currently. Mm -hmm. uh, Annie Laurie Gaylor from the Freedom From Religion Foundation did an excellent job of compiling uh, previous atheists in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. Yeah. So now what like I guess my first question there about coming to atheism is, is really kind of a two pronged question, because obviously part of it is what led you away from religion. But the other part is what brought you into activism. So what inspires you to get this project started? Were you already an active atheist? No, I wasn't. I was having lunch in downtown Portland with a friend of mine who uh, Kate Dyer Seeley, who is an author. She writes mystery novels, which are excellent. And she said, Karen, I think you should write a book. And I said, well, the United States Supreme Court had just issued its decision a few days previously in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. And you may be familiar with this case. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, the five Catholic men on the Supreme Court who voted for this decision said that because Hobby Lobby had certain religious views, it was not obligated to provide certain forms of birth control under the Affordable Care Act to its employees. And I was thinking about that, and I told my friend, the only thing I can get passionate about is atheism. And that really started me on this journey. I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Peter Bogosian. He wrote a manual for creating atheists. Somebody introduced uh, me to him early on, and he has been my mentor and assisted me along the way. I have connected with people on Facebook and other social media. I have attended the local humanist, atheist, uh, et cetera, meetings in Portland. And I've probably read 150 books in the last year. Wow. Um, <laughs> now, is, is that where you, uh, where you ferreted out your authors was at these um, uh, gatherings and stuff? Or, or how did you go about uh, locating them? Well, I started out by bugging my friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, this is Oregon. So Oregon is probably the highest uh, percentage of atheists in the country. Uh, so I asked uh, friends of mine, and some of them said, well, you know, I'm an atheist, but I'm not interested in writing about it. Or, you know, I probably can't quite go that far. I'm not interested. But I started with that. And then um, I met people like Peter, who introduced me to other people who had different groups. And I started to attend meetings and ask if people were interested. And then uh, when I put the... Uh, the whole compilation together, my uh, publisher, Pitchstone Publishing, asked me to create a little more diversity. Oregon isn't the diversest, uh, the most diverse state. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I reached out through social media and was able to obtain women, uh, maybe with a little different perspective, who were interested in writing. And I believe I added about six essays at that time. Right, because that, that's one of the things that I did actually notice when I was reading it, and that's one of the things that really made it most interesting to me is that we got uh, some perspectives from women growing up Christian in, in Africa or growing up Catholic in Peru and everything. Now, there was one sort of homogeneous uh, uh, thread through it that all, all but one of the essays were about women leaving uh, Christian denominations. You had one essay from a former Jew, but other than that, it was all flavors of Jesus. Now, was that a conscious decision on your part, or was that just a byproduct of what you had available? Uh, that was a byproduct of what was available. I think uh, given that Christianity is the largest religion in the United States, uh, I thought it was appropriate to focus on that. Um, I do have plans for another book, uh, which is going to be composed of essays of authors who are going to examine all the different reasons that women should leave religion. And I do plan to include, if possible, um, and I've already started soliciting authors, women who are Muslim and from some other faiths. Mm -hmm. I can imagine the Muslim women would have a lot to add on that particular subject. Um, exactly. Now, I apologize if this comes off like asking who your favorite kid is or something, but, um, and so I'm happy to withdraw the question if it is, but is there one story or one moment within one of these stories that struck you the most or moved you the most? Well, I think my, it's hard to say favorite, but I think Ann Wilcox's story about leaving fundamentalist religion. And as I said earlier, she is the person who I talked to about at the coast, how shame and guilt 
influence your personality and influence who you think you are forever mm -hmm. and how enduring it is. I think uh, a lot of the people who write about atheism, and I was doing a survey of books on Amazon, and I found that six out of the top hundred were women, which means a predominant number of them are, women, uh, are men. And men come from... Uh, the men who write about atheism, a lot of them come from philosophy, science, etc., that are, you know, uh, have been until recently male dominated fields. But one of the things that we don't look at is culture and all of the different trappings of culture, uh, whether it's a ritual, whether it's speech, whether it's a community, uh, whether it's language. It traps you in so many different ways that we're not even conscious of. I was listening to TV last night and somebody sang a beautiful rendition of Ave Maria. And that touched me in a way that it wouldn't somebody, someone else who wasn't raised religiously. So subconsciously, emotionally, physically, whatever, that song just just had an amazing effect on me. So I think this, how does culture reproduce itself is fascinating. Uh, plus, I'm trying to loop back to that PhD dissertation I did on cultural reproduction that I never used. So I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying, I was, you know, 30 years ago, I'm trying to pull something out of that. <laughs> Make make all the time I spend on it worthwhile. Right. That's why I use big words. I want to make sure I get my college tuitions worth. <laughs> uh, now, I got to say, there was one moment. I, I just want to uh, uh, highlight this one moment in the book that really stood out to me. It was early on. I believe it was in the second uh, story uh, about a uh, Jehovah's Witness woman. And within her story, she's talking about a moment where she had to convince a group of men, a group of elders in her church, that she'd gotten pregnant by, in her words, dry humping in a hot tub. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who like immediately snicker at that because that's comically bizarre and everything. But within the context of the story, you recognize what's at stake here. And this insane thing that she has to convince these people of, if she's unable to do that, she may lose contact with her family. She may never speak to her parents again. And, and so it's it's so easy from a person for a person in my perspective who was not raised religious to look at some of these things and just instinctively laugh at them. But when you get these human stories and you recognize that as silly as the, this is, there are very serious things at stake here. I mean, I think that's that and, and like you said, sort of that endurance of religion even after you left. I think those are the two main themes that that I walked away from this book with that and, and regret of you know what could have been. Well, and I think, as you well know, uh, if sometimes if we don't laugh, we'll cry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I may have had uh, something in between at that particular moment. Um, now, were there any big lessons that you took away from the project? Anything that you didn't expect that you learned? Well, I, I think growing up where I did, um, it was, I kind of call it namby-pamby Lutheranism. When I was in ninth grade, we learned about evolution. There was no opposition to that. Nobody walked out of the classroom. It was accepted. My father, who was very religious, was uh, very interested in evolution and science. So there were a lot of things in my upbringing uh, that I associated with religion that weren't, you know, intense shame, intense guilt. Now, I, we can talk later, if you wish, about my lack of sex education, what that got me to. But for many of these women... It was a very, very difficult experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I was aware of all the different denominations and all the different uh, ways where they keep people away from other people. And the example you talked about, the disfellowship, uh, it, it, it's hard to leave. Do you want to really say goodbye to your family? And I have several of the authors are using pseudonyms for that very reason. Right, right. Well, it, I'm still using a pseudonym for the exact same one. Now, I, I've only got you for a few more minutes here, so I do want to kind of circle back to the question we opened up with. Now, obviously, I don't expect you to have a one-size-fits-all answer here or anything, but do you have any theories as to why women in this country are so much more religious than men? Uh, yeah, I think there's many reasons. Um, I think that up until recently, you know, women were the ones uh, in charge of the children. So they're responsible for, it, you know, getting the kids off to school, educating them. If somebody's going to take them to church, 
that's going to be the woman. And uh, Sakibo Hutchison wrote a book called Moral Combat, and she is an African American, and she focused on why do women cling so much. And one of the things she said, if a woman doesn't take her own kids, a grandmother will step in and take them. My husband, as an example, his mother, who's 95 today, who is on the a funeral committee for her local Catholic parish. So you might say they might be a bit desperate. She always says, I really uh, hope the book's going well, but don't talk to me about it. Um, And his father was stayed at home. So she was the one responsible for taking the kids, um, having them go to Sunday school. My husband did skip out the back, but I, I think that's been the role. And I do believe that if women walked out of church, the church is a would fall apart because they do so much of the work, whether it's um, the potluck and cooking the food or doing the funerals or putting the flowers on or helping to clean or folding bulletins. They are doing a lot of the unpaid labor that keeps that church going. So if women walk away, uh, we can start making those churches into libraries and bookstores. I like the sound of that. Now, do you, but do you think there's – it, would you say it's entirely culture then, the reason why – because obviously, like I said, the Christian religion uh, and, and all the Abrahamic religions are spectacularly sexist in their details. <laughs> and it just seems to me that if anyone should be walking out of these churches, it should be the women. So do you think that's just cultural reinforcement that, that uh, keeps so many women blind to the sexism and chauvinism in their church? Well, I think that's true. Plus, you know, when I was growing up, nobody talked about, you know, uh, fighting the Ammonites. And when God says, oh, yeah, and when you're back there fighting them, rip the fetuses out of the pregnant women's bellies. I mean, nobody talks about those things. Uh, So a lot of the really negative uh, material isn't emphasized. Uh, One of the things that Martin Luther wrote, uh, I did a blog post about this, is on Jews and their lives lies. And he went on and on this diatribe against Jews, which certainly, you know, contribute to the Holocaust, uh, I believe. So you don't hear the part, you don't hear the negative part, you hear the good stories, you hear about Noah, and it's really a series of stories. When I went to Concordia and had my first religion class, they talked about the exile in Babylon as being an historical event. But that was a surprise to me. They talked about all the different oral traditions of the Old Testament. Never heard that before. So these pastors learn things in theology, but then they don't bring them back when they t- and talk about them. Right, and I really think it, it gives you a, an idea what a paucity of good stuff they've got, that when you gave the example of the good stories, they tell you it's the one where God floods the entire world and kills all but eight <laughs> of the people. <laughs> there you go. So uh, uh, now again, the name of the book is Women Beyond Belief, Discovering Life Without Religion. It comes out is uh, October 1st, is that right? Yes, and it's available for pre-order on Amazon. Excellent, excellent. And it'll be available then wherever fine atheist books are sold, I assume? Yes. All right. Now, is there anywhere uh, other than the blog where our uh, listeners might follow you to keep up to date on wh- what's coming? Well, I have a Twitter account at Karen underscore Garst. I have a YouTube channel. If you just go to YouTube and do Faithless Feminist, you'll see some of the talks I've done. And I have a Facebook page. If you just go to Facebook and say Faithless Feminist, you'll find me. Excellent. And of course, we'll have that all linked on the show notes as well. Well, thanks again for putting this resource together. And Karen, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. I really appreciated the opportunity. It was fun. Glad to hear it.